you put a label on genetically engineered food, you might as well put a skull and crossbones on it. Norm Bratzik, president of Ass Road Seed, a subsidiary of Monsanto. They will avoid labelling to the death almost. This sort of stuff, and this is in the ingredients, no one much reads it. But this is the sort of stuff they really don't want to know about. Now here is some beautiful gobbledygook about why we don't need labelling. Labelling GMOs runs counter to the science and the public interest in healthy food and would interfere with the FDA science-based process to determine what food labelling is necessary for consumers. Debbie Stabenow, Chair of the Agriculture Committee in the US. Um, I got these off a site called um, March Against Monsanto on Facebook. Isn't that priceless? In California, when they run a presidential election or whatever, they often run uh, referenda with them. The last presidential election when um, Barack Obama was re-elected <coughs> in the second term, Proposition 37 in California was, we want our GE food labelled. The top 10 supporters of the campaign are those people, and the top 10 uh, the, the, the supporters spent $9.2 million promoting vote yes. Those opposed to the vote, those who didn't want to see GE labelling, there's the top 10, spent $46 million. They won the, the referenda by 1.5%. This is in a country where, um, <coughs> out of the, um, hot, the, the heat of one of these referenda, 70% of Americans want GE food labelled. Um, the ones that um, opposed it, Monsanto, 8 million. DuPont, another biotech company, 5.4 million. Pepsi can, I hope, hope you don't agree with it. Um, Grocery Manufacturers Association, Kraft Foods, Bayer Crop Science, a biotech company, um, Dow AgroSciences, a biotech company, Bass Air Plant Science, a biotech company, Syngenta Corporation. Are those dollars, they? They're US dollars. That's how much each of those companies put into the campaign against labelling GM. 1.5%. They got it by. Uh, these are probably vote, green voters. But Every last one of them. <laughs> but don't people have a right to know what's in their food and where it's come from? Isn't that such a simple concept? And we are fighting tooth and nail in Australia to try and get our labelling up to some sort of standard. And New Zealand is not much better off than we are, if any. So... In 1999, at the Biotech Industry Conference, a representative from Arthur Anderson's and Holly Group revealed their company had helped Monsanto create a strategy to own the patents, patents on 100% of all commercial seeds grown and ensure the natural seeds were virtually extinct. What you're seeing is not just a consolidation of seed companies, it's really a consolidation of the entire food chain. R. Fraley, co-president of Monsanto's ag sector. I'm not into conspiracy theories, but this doesn't look good. It's a hell of a thing to say that the Wyoming winners don't give the consumer a choice. Dan Adolf, Canadian Seed Growers Association. Isn't Arthur Anderson the accounting firm behind Enron? Behind? Yeah. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's a highly around. Yeah, oh, we're playing in the big league here. Yeah. So was Arthur Anderson right? Control of this, this is two different sites that I got this from. Control of the seed industry is passing into fewer and fewer hands. More than 80% of US corn and more than 90% of soil beans planted each year are attributable to Monsanto. Monsanto licensed their technology to other seed companies, most of which they own anyway. Um, or on Agweb, the big four biotech seed companies, Monsanto, DuPont Pioneer, which is one company, Syngenta and Dow own 80% of the US corn market and 70% of the soybean business, just those four companies. In 05, Monsanto bought Seminus. This is a worldwide process they've got of acquiring seed companies, the owners of the genetics of your food. They now own thousands of conventional seed companies in addition to their GMO seed, in addition to their GMO seed business. 
own 40% of the conventional seed market in the US and 20% worldwide. There's an incomplete list of Monsanto-owned seed companies. And I know it's incomplete because the mob I grew canola for isn't on that list. And nor is Yates, which I think is effectively yeah. sucked into it. This is US, Canada and Europe. Hasn't got Asia Pacific on it. Yeah, the A's are uh, adaptive seeds, all with things organic. Amish land seeds. Scary, isn't it? So there you go, just to nail the point home, what we're seeing is not just a consolidation of seed companies, we are really, it's really a consolidation of the entire food chain. So how do you get all this together? How do you make it happen? This is a list of Monsanto positions, names, federal government position in the US. I'll climb it up a bit. At the top, if you look there, much of number five, Michael A. Friedman, Mr. Substantial Equivalence. And in that case, he is Senior Vice President for Clinical Affairs for GD Searle and Company, merged with Monsanto, and across the other side, Acting Commissioner for the Food and Drug Administration. And you've got Donald Rumsfeld further on down. Yeah, Donald Rumsfeld, he, he's uh, oh, successfully uh, had aspartame legalised while he was working in the private industry and appointed Secretary of Defence in '95. Um, where, where, where can I get a copy of that? That's actually, if you have a look on the um, March Against Monsanto website, you'll find it on there. Mm -hmm. I got a hold of it a couple of years ago. Now, I can email it to mm -hmm. May the 6th, last month, a new law was put before the European Commission which creates new power to, to classify and regulate all plant life anywhere in Europe. Under the new law, it's immediately illegal to grow, reproduce or trade any vegetable, seed or tree that's not been tested and approved by the new EU plant variety agency who will approve these things and you pay a fee to keep a seed on the list. Officially, it's to simplify and bring up the date a lot of old laws. In reality, it seems to be mostly about a globalised business, agribusiness seed industry needing new laws to cope with gene patents and plant patients. And it could be extremely effective in eliminating heritage seeds from the market. Isn't there a huge uh, seed bank somewhere? Pardon? Isn't there like a seed bank somewhere in, well, I mean, yeah, in Norway? Norway. That, yes, yeah. it's, in, it's in Norway. It's like buried underground. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's basically in the permafrost. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and guess who has access to it? Probably Monsanto now. Yeah. So yeah. be trying to... You've got to be someone yeah. special to get anywhere near it. Yeah. There's, there's incidentally one act Lincoln Uni? Um, Ma no, Massey. Massey, we, last time you were over, we listed the pasture seed, the grass, grass <coughs> one at Massey. Yeah, Massey okay. University. There's one at Horsham, just near home, which, which is the Australian crop seed, seed bank. Um, and they say all the nice things like, yeah, people have access to it, yeah, fine. And then you have a law like that, which means you might have access to it, but as soon as you want to produce it, uh, yeah. You've got major yeah. So that's the sort of stuff that's happening. Now, we could do so much better. There's a whole heap of stuff we're not doing where money is going into biotech and there's a lot of other areas where I believe we should be doing it. Now, the chart doesn't matter that much. It's just a, a, a chart of what happens in our soil, who, who's there, what they do, and who they do it with. Okay? Um, there's three PhDs in that photograph. but this is a bloke who bought a flogged out piece of farmland and is regenerating it, and that's the level of regeneration in just four years. Outside his little exclusion zone that he was standing outside, this has just had a thousand sheep on it for a month and there's still a hundred percent cover, ground cover. In Australia, this is brilliant stuff. Just brilliant. Um, the biggest creature, living creature I know of, is in the Shenandoah Valley in the US of A. It's 40 kilometres across and it's a fungus. These are the fruiting bodies of fungi. And this, this photo was taken on my farm. They're actually horse mushrooms. And that's my ugly old work boot. And my really bad sewing on the cuff. 
your farmers here in New Zealand put thousands and thousands and thousands of tonnes of urea on their paddocks to put nitrogen in there for their grass to grow so you can turn it into milk for Frontera and so on. This, in our country we grow a lot of legume crops, beans, peas, chickpeas and so on, which put nitrogen into the soil, they're legumes. There's actually three living nitrogen fixes in existence. Azotobacter is just one of them. We're not researching these fellas. We're ignoring them. <coughs> we should be building farming systems that work in sympathy with the land we live on. Not belted into submission with chemicals and, and, and uh, pushing genes around. Mycorrhizal fungi. Every crop I grow, with the exception of canola, grows in a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizal fungi. A bloke in Mexico found a grass growing on the side of a volcano. So ground temperature 70 degrees, rainfall, not much. He inoculated garden variety ordinary wheat with that mycorrhizal fungi and grew it under drought conditions in replicated trials with the same wheat, not, not, not inoculated. 60% yield increase and it used half the water. Now the biotech people have been promising us drought resistance and increased yields in wheat for years that have delivered nothing and they'd be screaming their heads off with joy if they got 5%. This guy's got 5, 10, 60% with stuff that's hanging around in the soil on the side of a mountain in Mexico. Well, depends on the yeah, you can't put it in the 20 metre drum. Mm -hmm. uh, Pasture cropping. This is a photograph of a guy called Colin Sykes in Australia. He's got a system that uses summer grasses and winter crops. It doesn't matter when the rain falls on his farm in Australia, and much of the agriculture in Australia is <coughs> rainfall limited. It doesn't matter when the rain falls on his farm, it grows something for him, be it a crop or be it food for itself. Brilliant system. This guy's a maverick. The scientists sort of poke around the edges of what he's doing, but they can't get funding to do that. So after GM commercial release in Australia, it will contaminate your non-GE crops. The non-GE growers carry the cost of segregations and so on. People who have a choice, and have a choice you've got to have labelling, don't buy GE. It will divide your community. My neighbour and I still talk to each other, very politely and never about anything of importance. Can I ask you something? You may. Um, does, does he have a reason why he went to GE crops? Yeah. He had a ryegrass problem. Um, ryegrass is a major crop weed in our area. Uh, can severely damage the yield potential of the crop. He had a ryegrass issue. He was promised all sorts of things with his GE ryegrass, uh, Roundup resistant canola. He sowed it. <laughs> The, the glyphosate or Roundup spraying of the crop failed to control the ryegrass anyway, and then he contaminated me on top of it. Are there some sides with you? Pardon? Does he feel sorry for you? We don't talk about it. No. We haven't talked about anything significant. The day I met Monsanto in the paddock, he was there. We never said a word to each other. Like, this is a country community. There's not many of us left out there. We don't need this bulldog. What happened to Julie Newman's story? I mean, she was trying to stop you a long time ago. Julie's a good friend of mine. I'll talk about it later if you like.